And those of you who have, have seen me with guests on the show before know that I'm a terrible interviewer. And I thought maybe one of the most uh, fun things we could do would be just to get capping up the blackboard and drill him with questions and he, see how smart he is. Um, but we'll, we'll save that for a few minutes. We should, we should have, have a little, little chat. Let him, let him say, say hello to his, uh, his parents. Is that uh, what you like to do? <laughs> hi there. <laughs> all right. Well, people don't usually say this on every show, but hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, <laughs> Dad. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, and, uh, well, I'll just see what I can do. I yeah. watch this show sometimes. It's a, it's a great show. Thank you for the endorsement. Um, <laughs> now, what we had with uh, Mr. Barsby when he was our teacher, the big deal for us was Thursday afternoon math contest meetings. Um, do they still happen on Thursday afternoons? Um, no, they don't actually. We just, <laughs> just have math contests every once in a while in school. Every but once in a while? No. Nope. Well, yes, but we don't have the, the don't? regular math contest meetings, no. How about, I mean, before Christmas, when, when the, now the school is over, okay, you don't have them now, but you mean even in the year you don't have weekly, no, weekly we don't. sessions? No, Oh, that's unbelievable, because look, when, when I was in uh, grade 11, it was the big thing about Thursday, and the best thing was if we had double English on Thursday afternoon, because, because I would get the next week's problems at the Thursday meeting, and I wouldn't look at them, I'd close them in my notebook, and I'd uh, keep them until, uh, until the following week, especially if there was double English, because then the teacher would start talking and I'd tune out and tune into my math problems, and I'd work on my math problems, and you're all fired up about them, and you go to the meeting and see how the other guys have solved the problems, and uh, you're not doing them every week then. Oh, yeah, that's, that's too bad. I'll have to ask him about that. I guess we should start that up again. Um, yeah, how do you manage to... Uh, to win the math contest still. I thought that was an <laughs> essential ingredient because this is the, the deal. We, uh, we used to do real well in the math contest. The University of Waterloo would put out a, a math contest for grade 11s and John would get us all p pumped up on math and we'd, we'd write the contest and, and our school would, would, would usually win or come in second or something. And you guys still, still manage to do that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess we spend, a, we spend a fair amount of time in math class, you know, around math contest season. We go through old stuff and do questions and things like that. Oh, so it's come right into the classroom. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, because, well, you can do that there because you've, with the, the small school, you have the flexibility to, to structure your classes uh, the, the way you like, I guess. Um, now, we had the Waterloo contest, uh, and you still have that one? Yeah, yeah, we do. How did you uh, do on Waterloo this year? Um, I did okay, actually. I did um, the Fermat, which is for grade 11, and the Euclid, which is for grade 12. And okay. um, I did pretty well in the Euclid. <laughs> you can tell us if you won. We won't. Uh, okay, well, I did. <laughs> one Manitoba or one Canada? Canada. Oh, okay, there you go. Tied so. for first. There were three people who got 100. Yeah. Um, I think uh, John's success back in our years, which is going on 20 years ago, with mass contests, sort of suggested to other schools that they could get into this competition in a heavy way. And nowadays, there's both much more stiffer competition on account of more schools taking this very competitive attitude towards preparation. And there's also a plethora of new contests which were being written, like you had the Pascal and the Euclid and the Fermat. And, uh, but you still managed to win your share. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good to, good to hear. Um, there's a very interesting contest called the um, a Amy? Yeah, yeah. American right. Institute of something or other. And um, this year, John passed the contest on to me. Tell us the format of that, uh, that oh, uh, test. Oh, um, they've got uh, 15 questions on the test, mm -hmm. and it's kind of weird. It's uh, multiple choice with a thousand choices. <laughs> the idea is that every answer you write down, um, it's a three-digit integer. Um, and every question, they manage to convert it into that form. So that you don't have to write everything out, but you have to be right on, otherwise you don't get a mark. And so it's, uh, it's out of 15. Yeah, it's amazing how uh, much mathematics they can put into a question where the answer ultimately has to reduce to uh, an integer format. But uh, I know you wrote it, and John passed the test on to me, and I, I wrote it as well. I gave myself a three-hour limit, and uh, I got eight questions. How did you make out? 
Um, I, th I think I got the same, actually. Eight or eight or nine, maybe, but I don't remember. Yeah. It was probably about the same. Yeah, you probably got nine. You probably did a little better than me, because really it's, it's, it's a young man's game, this, <laughs> this math contest stuff. Well, you know, age and experience has got to count for something, but, but uh, uh, man, uh, there's questions, you know, that you can see it's a geometry question, and ultimately you're asked for a distance and altitude of some crazy triangle, which is in three dimension, and you know you can crank it out eventually. But a lot of the problem is, like, the decision as to what pathway you're going to choose, like how you choose your coordinates. and. Whereas one pathway could take you half an hour to crank through, another one might get in 15 minutes. So what is it that lets you choose the right pathway? Um, I don't know, really. Geometry is really kind of special because um, for geometry questions, there are literally, I don't know, 10 or 20 different solutions you could have and some different stuff. Uh, I guess after doing a bunch of math contests, you get to notice some of the, some of the little tricks that you get for speeding things up. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, do, you do get a feel for for choosing, choosing right methods of attack. But I don't know, it's, 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 it's an art and it's a science and it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it is. is a lot of fun. <laughs> um, anyhow, I thought, uh, see, one thing I'm, I'm real interested in is how people think, how, how people think in, in terms of math and how, how they, they work out. You got a certain impression of how you do it in your own head, and you want to get in someone else's head and see if they're going the same way. And uh, one thing I, I do, I work at the university as a, as a technician, so I'm in contact with a lot of academics. Sometimes I'll ask them, ask them questions just to see how, how their mind works. And usually the funny thing about these guys is they, they're very busy people. I mean, they don't want to be asked math questions. You can't find a guy that wants to try a good math question. I, I really don't understand this state of mind. I mean, I, I'm myself I'm never so busy that I wouldn't drop whatever I'm doing to try, try my hand at a math question. But the, these guys, uh, university kind of guys, they always seem to have more important things to do. And uh, I know Ping won't, uh, won't mind trying trying some math questions cold. Um, he's obviously, you know, smart enough that if he gets the wrong answer, it's not an embarrassment. Um, I, I, you see, I'm trying to remember, I wanted to say something about the salary freeze, because I started talking about the professors, and of course, of course, uh, they, uh, the government said they're freezing salaries of all university employees. No, not of, of all university. They're not freezing the university. They're freezing all the provincial government employees, except uh, there's some exempted classes, and university workers are exempted. And uh, a couple of other categories. Speaking, speaking for university workers, I, I think it's an embarrassment that we're, we're exempted. I, I make 36,000 bucks a year. I think it's a, a king's ransom, and we got unbelievable benefits. I have a seven-hour working day, long weekends in the summer, three weeks vacation, and I'm just a technician. And uh, I don't see why my salary couldn't be frozen along with everyone else's in these, uh, in these times of uh, when the country's going into the hole at the rate of $30 billion a year. I don't see why uh, the university should get exempted, but I guess they have a an influential lobby group. Just about every week they're in the newspaper whining about how they're not getting enough money. And I guess maybe the government just didn't, didn't want to poke them, poke them in this time to arouse their, their uh, complaints again. So they sort of, they gave them this exemption for no reason that I can see. But uh, anyhow, that's not the topic of today's show. Bing, I'll ask you a simple question just to demonstrate the basic concepts of geometric intuition here. If we suppose okay. <laughs> that this table has a thousand square inches area, oh, okay. suppose the area of the table is one thousand square inches, and we make it one percent longer, one percent wider, what would the new area of the table be, more or less? Oh, okay. Well, you take um, 101 percent, which is like the amount that the amount of the table you're getting wider, and you multiply that by 101%, which is the amount that you're making it um, longer. Mm -hmm. Longer. This is longer. That's wider. 
um, and you get a number which is, uh, I think, 102.01%. And then you multiply that by um, 1,000 square inches, right? Right, so okay. Yeah. That gives you 1,020 square inches. Perfect answer. Um, <laughs> I've got to, I've got to ask, uh, ask you uh, harder questions than that if I'm going to shake you up. That's, that's a question a lot of uh, university guys uh, do have trouble taking, uh, uh, getting the answer to. I mean, uh, it came up in an argument a few weeks ago over whether people actually learn something when, when they take calculus. And I said, look, I think you took calculus, all you guys sitting here, and you didn't learn anything. And I asked the same question about the table. And... Uh, no one, no one really got it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you learn calculus, you pass the test, but th is that a calculus question? Not really, no. Um, it's just, I guess, it might fool the guy who's doing it and trying to figure out what the size of the table is, and you can't do that. But you know that um, if you add 1% of the length, that adds 1% of the whole area and the same thing. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I consider it a kind of a calculus question, because to me, the idea of calculus is that it's a smart idea to not worry about that extra 0.01% after the 2%. <laughs> that it is 1% longer and 1% wider, then it's basically 2% bigger. Um, now, uh, it's actually 2% and a little bit more, but the little bit more is just the tiny piece in this far corner here that yep. wasn't accounted <laughs> for this 1% and that 1% over there. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, um, of course, if you had a, a cubicle table and you made it 1% higher and 1% longer and 2% bigger, then the volume of the box enclosed would be, of course, uh, around 4% bigger. <laughs> that's the idea. Okay, now let's, uh, let's give, give you something something a little bit harder and maybe, maybe get you on the, the blackboard thinking about something while we do a song. Um, how are you on uh, trajectories? Trajectories? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure if I've tried anything quite like that, but I'm sure. You know how, uh, <laughs> how far a ball falls in one second? Um, accelerates, what is it, 9.8 meters, something like that. 9.8 meters per second. Second per second. per second. And you take half of... Yeah. So how far would it fall? Give it 10. Call it 10 meters per okay, second. Okay, 10 meters per now second. How far would something fall in one second? I think from rest that would be... I'm just guessing here, five? Because yeah. it's something like a half something squared. Yeah. It is something like that. And five is, five is a good answer. And actually right now, given that it's fallen five meters in the first second, how far does it get by the end of the second second? Um, it gets to... Uh, <laughs> gets to um, 20 meters down from where you started. Of course, <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, third second? Um, that'd be uh, 45 meters down from where you started. Does our home audience know how <laughs> Bing is uh, coming up with these figures? Is it apparent to, uh, why am I asking you? I'm on television, no one's <laughs> going to answer me, okay. Um, in the general studio participation here, is it obvious where these figures are coming from? Get to the board and show it. Okay. <laughs> Ooh, again, walking over my cords. Okay. Okay. Um, you explain what well, we've just done. Okay, I don't know exactly what the formula is, but a ball kind of falls like that. And um, the ball accelerates by a constant amount every unit of time, and that's, we just rounded that off to 10 meters per second per second. Um, and the formula goes like uh, a half of the acceleration squared or something like that. I just kind of plucked it out of my head, and he said it was right, so I guess it's right. <laughs> and uh, if we take it to be 10 meters per second, then um, after one second, it will fall 5 meters, right? That's half of 1 squared. And then after another second, it will fall 20 meters. And after another second, it will have fallen a total of 45 meters. And um, actually, don't have to check the other ones because as long as you know this one's five, you know the other ones um, are in the ratio to that one as the squares are, which means um, that sounds like a rather, rather awful way of putting a very simple thing. But um, the um, distance that the ball falls is proportional to the square of the time. So five is um, five times one, and twenty is five times four, and forty-five is five times nine, which is three squared. That is the way it goes. Yep. <laughs> All right, now we're going to do a song, and uh, while, uh, while we do the song, I'd like you to uh, 
work on the problem of a cannonball shot with uh, out of a muzzle at a 345 trajectory. Not the oh. high 345, the low 345. Okay. Yeah. Give it 100 meters per second velocity. Oh. Whoa. Got my triangles around here. 100 meters per second velocity. And tell me how far it gets. And we're going to do a song. And, oh, okay. uh, don't interrupt the song with your answer. We'll, you should hopefully uh, finish this by the time we get to the end of the song. 100 meters per second initial velocity. I don't know my physics. <laughs> 100 meters per second. You know, uh, okay. you know uh, breaking into vector, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Okay, then you're away, you're away. be able to get it. Yeah, if you want to okay. if you want to think away from the music, you can just walk out of the studio while... Or no, actually, it'll be more oh, fun. No, while we're it. playing, they can be panning the camera to you and watching. <laughs> he doesn't need to know the camera. <laughs> See, this guy is smart enough that the distraction of the music should not be a, should not be a major factor. And we'll, we'll see what you get from that. And then we'll check it out okay. at the end. <laughs> now, right. we're back to our, our musical board. Could you please not scratch the chalk so loud? <laughs> no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, we love getting letters, and here's a letter. Dear Marty, a big hello from your fan friends west of the Red River. We watch your show every week and would like to tell you how great it is. Thank you. Keep up the good work, Marty. Your fans, Yvonne, June, Loretta, and Ryan. Wow. P.S. Your songs are great. We love your music. Could you please sing a song for us? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, here's a song by... Uh, by Freddie Fender. Now, Freddie Fender had uh, two real big hits back in the 70s. Uh, yeah, it's what they call the Tex-Mex sound, a sort of uh, Mexican guy singing country music. And one of them was that beautiful song, uh, Before the Next Teardrop Falls, where he actually does a verse in Spanish. That's a real nice touch. And, uh, and the other one was this... Uh, Wasted days and wasted nights. Wasted days and wasted nights. I have left for you behind. Cause you don't belong to me. Cause you belong to somebody else. Why should I keep loving you? When I know that you're not true. And why should I call your name when you're the blame for making me blue? Do you remember the day when you went away and left me? I was so lonely, cry for you only. My Why should I keep loving you when I know that you're not true? And why should I call your name when you're the blame for making me blue? Do a lead me. Chalky smoking, <laughs> you were so lonely, cried for you only, my love. Why should I keep loving you when I know that you're not true? And why should I call your name when you're the blame for making me blue? Turn to the the big board, and I hear the, the sound of chalk dust is is no longer going on. But I think you you do have a few minutes to, to check over your work because we just like to do a little bit of analysis on on the song. Uh, well, there's no analysis as such, except we just want to point out the use of the augmented chord, the 
the augmented chord is defined as the normal chord, dun, 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 where the third note is raised the semitone, giving that, that added color of tension, leading to the tonic chord. Use of the augmented chord gives a nice little color to that song. Now, uh, how does uh, the, the calculation... The chord is mathematically interesting. It is mathematically because interesting. Because it's the same chord in four different keys. That's right. It's... Uh, uh, the notes of a G augmented chord are also the notes of a B augmented and also the notes of an E flat augmented because it's, uh, the notes are equally spaced within the octave. But I don't think we have time to talk about, talk about that as much as I'm sure the audience would like because Ping would like to... Show us the result of this fascinating calculation. Now okay. give her. Um, we got a man over here who's, I don't know, your math teacher or something like that. And um, the wall's going to go up for a certain amount of time, and it's going to come down for the same amount of time, and it's going to land in this guy's head. And we've got to figure out, first of all, um, how long it's going to be before it lands in his head. Um, so if it's going 100 meters a second like this, right, then we just kind of scale up the triangle. You get 100 by 60 by 80. So that's three, four, five. Um, so we can break it up into vectors and say the ball's traveling 80 meters a second that way and 60 meters a second that way. Um, all this junk down here was really kind of unnecessary because um, uh, balls speed up going down at about 10 meters a second, um, which is a, the rounded figure we use. So it would take six seconds to go up and six seconds to go down, making 12 seconds. And 12 seconds times 80 is 960 meters. Um, and if you use 9.8, then you get this big mess here, which gives you about 980 meters. Perfect solution. Perfect solution. I'm, I'm uh, just speechless because, like, you've done all the right things. Like, this guy has made all the right connections. Notice that, that uh, first, to find the time in the air, all you've got to realize is you're starting 60 meters a second going up. Every second you're losing 10 meters per second because that's the acceleration of gravity. So after six seconds, you have no more upwards velocity left. That means 12 seconds time of flight, 80 meters per second forward. Fantastic solution. Just the way it's done. You'll never see it that done that way in university. I mean, they'll always be doing one calculus. half 80 squared and read a lot of calculus on that. But if you just think about it, man, those things just come out just right. And uh, nice problem, nicely done. And, uh, and uh, we are getting near the end of the show. We have about uh, just a couple minutes left. Uh, I don't think uh, you're going to sing a song with us uh, today. Have they been, by the way, uh, flashing your name on, on the board while you've been on the screen? I don't know. If... I saw it once. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sure the technicians... I See, uh, I'm quite oblivious to the production aspect of the show, and <laughs> we've never done this thing. That's right, where we have that nameplate going on, and it's really a, a step up in our, <laughs> our uh, quality of our, our program. And the technicians, of course, they're, they're used to this, and they, they always get that right. And... Uh, well, let's just uh, wrap it up with a little bit of a song, and uh, then uh, we'll be back next week with more great math topics. What do we got for song again? Oh, I know what I like to do. I've got the organ fired up. I want to do this instrumental, Don't Break the Heart That Loves You. This is like a Connie Francis song. I love it. <laughs> Thank you.